Hello, how are you today? Thank you for joining us um, this morning for our Bible study. Um, I want to talk about righteousness today. <clears throat> righteousness is uprightness or, or living in the path that God has given us to live in this life by His grace. Uh, remember the 23rd Psalm, He leadeth us in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. Sometimes we get out of those paths. We are a people that are prone to stray and wander off on our own, thinking we know a better way, thinking that uh, we can outdo uh, what God has given us to do. But most of us always find, and every believer truly will, that God's ways are always the best ways, even though they might not be always our ways. We do have a merciful, holy God, but if we have a God that is very big on righteousness, um, remember, um, Jesus died on the cross, not only to save our sins, but to give us his righteousness. It's the only way God could really love us and have us and hold us and shape us and mold us to be Christ-like because Jesus is the righteous one. Uh, remember, too, that God uh, says through uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. So that is an implication that God is looking for righteousness. God, God is, is looking for a man and woman that is that is bent on living right. Not only to live right, uh, but, uh, but that gives us the security of dying right. Uh, I remember Balaam, even though he was an evil man, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. Uh, we can't live wrong and die right. But when we live right, we die right. And we really need to be living to die because we're all going to do that. So it, it behooves us to be concerned about what we do and what we think and how we live and walk according to the paths of righteousness. Now this righteousness is not some sort of holier than thou mentality or exercise by any means, nor is it, is it a merit to uh, earn our salvation or impress God in works. It rather is a uh, uh, let's cause it a consequence, call it a consequence of God's uh, intervening in our life and, and giving us uh, His light, His righteousness, uh, so that we can live in this present evil world and be the lights of the world and solve the earth that He says we are. And God has done that to us. And His righteousness is, is what really gives us uh, the the desire to live holy lives and to keep on keeping on in our lives. Um, we're to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, Jesus says that. And, and, and the more we hunger and thirst for righteousness, the more righteous we try to live, the more hungry we get for it. I've said before, and I experience this a lot, I bet most of you do, that the more holier you try to be, the more righteous you try to be, the more unrighteous you realize you really are, the more unholy you are. And yet, when we right in that struggle of trying to live for God and walk in the paths of righteousness, um, we'll fight, feel the closeness of God like never before. Even though we know we're still sinners, we still struggle with unrighteousness in our lives. But but we have a God that, that gives us strength to live for Him because He dies for us and uh, He gave us His righteousness. Um, you know, righteousness, too, again, is the, the motivation we have to live in this world. We're not of the world, but we live in an unrighteous world. I don't have to tell you we're living in a time where uh, the culture is calling things that are right wrong and things that are wrong right. And uh, that really makes us, uh, uh, it, it, it fires us up. Righteousness is really the fire that every believer has in their heart. You remember when Jesus goes into the temple, uh, when he comes into Jerusalem, uh, right after he rode on the donkey, the fall of an ass, uh, to uh, fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament scriptures. Well, he goes into the temple where Ezekiel had prophesied that the Lord or the Spirit of God had departed. Here's God coming back to that temple. But what did he find there? He found money changers, uh, making a market out of religion and, and God's law, making whatever people wanted to do the right thing to do in the name of religion. That's the kind of world we're living now. We have churches 
that are using their traditions and other ideas to have more weight than God's holy word. And when Jesus comes in and he finds that, he turns the tables upside down. He, uh, he runs them out, he gets a whip, the scripture says. That's what Jesus did, and that's hard to imagine. Lots of people say, well, well he's just a God of love. He, he, he probably would have said, well, it's okay. You didn't really mean it, you can just do your thing. It's because of the uh, culture you was lived you were raised in or some circumstances that you face uh, so it's justifiable uh, he didn't cry social justice what he did was he ran them out and the Bible calls that not hatred not racism uh, Bible calls it righteous indignation that's what Jesus is and that's what every believer needs to be living under in this world today we got a lot of things to be driving out not only of, of churches, but our homes, our families, and really in our mi minds, because the mind is where that battle is fought so much of the righteousness. One verse of scripture I want to use today for uh, just some thoughts, and it's in the Psalm 36, and it says in verse 6, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a deep, great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. So here we see the righteousness of God is like a mountain. Either that's, you talk about a mountain, you're talking about something immovable. Uh, God gave his righteous law from a mount, Mount Sinai. And the people, you remember, didn't even want to wait 40 days for Moses to come back. They had to make him a golden calf and play around and do all kinds of sinful things. And uh, God was really upset about it. In fact, he said, I'm not going to go with them anymore. You remember, that's the place in Scripture where uh, Moses had to be the mediator. God was going to destroy the Israelites and just make them new people out of Moses. But Moses interceded. That's how Christ has done for us. He is our intercessor. Uh, and he prayed to God and asked God to, to, to reconsider that. And God did. But he said, my presence won't go before you. Uh, because why? They were not righteous. They had turned to the pagan gods. And God says, if I go with them, I'll have to kill them. And, and God is not going to go with us in our unrighteous deeds and acts. He is not going to go with a marriage or a church or, or anybody, any, any institution that he has arranged to be righteous and holy that man has made a mockery of. Uh, where two men are married, two women are married, or where some church is proclaiming to even deny the very virgin birth of Jesus and to... Uh, say that uh, things that God's Word calls an abomination is okay and that the Word of God is just applicable to the Old Testament or the old cultures and we're living in a new, more enlightened age. Man, that is the devil gone to, gone to the seed. That's what that is. And we need, to be, we need to be righteously motivated for God's righteousness to honor and glorify Him. His righteousness is like a mountain. But look, if you're going to live righteous. And, and I know that's what God's given us a desire to do with believers. Um, we we got to know it's, a, it's an uphill battle. It's climbing a mountain. It's not it's not a floating deal, you know. It's, it's not a, you can't be a floozy and, and and follow Jesus. You got you got to understand. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And that following is a righteous following. It's it's a, you step with God. You're going to have to step righteously, and. Um, what a blessing, what a grace that is, but it, it's a struggle. You know, a mountain, too, is, uh, is immovable. It, it says here, uh, thy righteousness, God's righteousness. It, it's not talking about man's righteousness. We, we have none. Uh, again, God gave us his righteousness. He says our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's not used for anything. Uh, but, but he does say, doesn't he? He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom of God. Righteous is a big deal with God. And, and, and the scribes and Pharisees, they were righteous in that they kept the law. They kept, uh, uh, they kept, uh, they knew the scriptures, uh, but they had a, they were whited sepulchers, Jesus described. They had a rights on the outside, but inwardly their heart. See, the heart is where the problem is. Um, I understand that, that the nation, uh, country Russia, they're a lot more righteous than the United States in a lot of ways. They don't, they don't put up with, uh, with homosexual lifestyles, gays and lesbians, and those kind of things. They're very orthodox in their, 
but but does that that's not the purity heart religion that Jesus gives us it's not and so we need to be we need to be concerned about our righteousness more than we are and, and I think sometimes we, we get that mixed up with self-righteousness and so we don't want to appear self-righteous uh, we want to, don't want nobody to think we're better than they certainly we're not but but what happens we just give every, give in to everything and, and that's not what Jesus did Jesus is righteous and, and you and I need to be living righteously because that is that fire that's burning and that's that fire that people need to see and your your family knows about that it isn't an influence that you and I have our families our friends the churches we serve God in or whatever it needs to be built on the righteous my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness the psalm says and that's exactly right uh, but it but it but it's not only being saved it's being righteous in that walk with God because that's what sanctification is about it's, it's the righteous walk with God, and it's a mountain. It's a mountain, too. It's not going to move. God's not going to change his righteousness. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his law. He's not going to wink at us and say, well, you know, uh, you're living a different era. No. He requires us to be righteous. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, none of us are, but I'm going to tell you, the righteousness of God makes us want to be and it should put a literal fire in our hearts. If we ever get to the point in our life, we become complacent with how we live um, and how we how we uh, deal with our lives. Uh, a mama that loves her children will always seem to be the one that's always fussing at them and guiding and directing. Why? Because she wants them to do right. She wants them to live right, live, and it proves that she loves them. And that's what God is calling us to do: to live righteously. And he will never, never give up. That's why he chastens those that he loves. Why? Because of unrighteousness in our lives. God will chasten us. And so he's forever that God. He says, that's how he preserves us. Oh, Lord, thou preservest man and beast. The very righteousness of God is what preserves us. I believe the reason the world is still standing, and I know God has a timing to it all, and the world's coming closer and closer to the end, and we see that for sure. But it's because of the, uh, of the remnant of God's people, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth is, is here. And that's what's preserving this world for the remnant that God, that God says. You know, God says to uh, Abraham when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, go, Abraham goes to him, well, what if I find 50 righteous? God says, yeah, I won't destroy. He couldn't find 50. He couldn't find, and he goes on down to 10. He couldn't find 10. He, he couldn't have found one. That, that's how sinful the place got. What did God do? He described it, but he, he removed first righteous lot. Long as righteousness was there, God was gonna, not going to live, destroy it. That's, what, that's the only thing that's holding this world. It's nothing we deserve. It's not because we're, we're trying to battle global warming or, 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 or to green up the, the atmosphere or, or whatever. Uh, or, or, or to love everybody and, and such as that. That's not, that's not going to work. Uh, social justice is not righteousness. In fact, it's just the opposite. And we need to see that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And, and, and that righteousness is like a mountain. And, and though, though it's a struggle, it's, it's like climbing that mountain. It too is a, is a, it's like a mountain trail in that. God says it's, it's righteous like a mountain. You think about it. You've been to the mountains. You get up and you get up in those areas and you've got these scenic overlooks. That's what God's righteousness will do in our lives and the paths of righteousness when we get there. Now, there's a lot of crooks and turns. There's no shortcuts to uh, getting to where God wants us to go. But when we get there, we're glad we got there. You know, a mountain trail is not a big road somewhere that's got a bunch of signs on it and, and signal lights and such. It is a trail, and you got to watch where you're going because you can miss the trail. Uh, but but it's a blessing to to be able to come to uh, correlate the rights of God with great mountains. Uh, I remember with my family in the mountains years ago. It's you know we would go to, uh, and I know it's probably not the biggest mountain around, but it's one. It was pretty big for us, like Bald Mountain in North Georgia, and, and you had the option: you could ride up it or walk up it. And you know what? 
I know there's some folks that probably couldn't walk, but I wanted to walk up. And I remember carrying my girls on, on my neck, walking up that mountain. I probably couldn't do that. I know I couldn't now, but nevertheless, it's like righteousness. And there were sure some resting points on the way. But I'm going to tell you, when you get up to the top, it's where you can see the glory of God. And you didn't really think about the, 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 the way the mountains were, the struggle, the steepness. You thought about how gracious God was, and you just stood there in awe. And that's what the righteousness of God looks like. When you see and can able to look back over your life and see how God has led you and preserved you and given you grace to live in this poor and sinful world, doesn't mean you haven't sinned, haven't made some fragrant mistakes. I know I have. But man, when I look back at the righteousness of God and how he's taken, taken even my ugliness and made something beauty, he does make beauty of ashes. And he does that when he burns it in the kennel of righteousness. That's what it is. And so when the three Hebrews went in the fiery furnace, that was a furnace, so to speak, of righteousness, I believe, because that they were following God. They were not adhering to what the world wanted them to do, King Nebuchadnezzar in that case. And the only thing that was burnt was the, the cords on their, on their arms. That's what righteousness does. It gives us the freedom to live for God. And, and, and what a blessing and what a grace that is in our lives. So I, want, I just want us to think about the importance of righteousness and understand that God's righteous like a great mountain uh, gives us uh, everything that God has called us to have and to have and to do. God invented pleasure, not man. I mean, we have this idea we can have more pleasure and have more fun, but it's not going to be by some unrighteousness that we dream of that we think can... can uh, fulfill the, the senses uh, of a fallen fleshly nature uh, that we have. Uh, and there's no shortcut. Mountains, the mountain of righteousness, you, you don't get to the mountains taking shortcuts. There's none, you know. Uh, I remember uh, years ago, I was in Alabama, North Alabama, which is somewhat mountainous, and I was with a, a landowner looking at his forest land, and uh, he, he had a lot of land and I'd like to do business with a guy the well, first time I met him so we were over there he was, he's a very intellectual guy as well but he'd never been out in the woods much I don't think but he had inherited all this property and so we go out there and you know in the mountains you can find where the old roads were that's the best place to go so there were trails and we followed the trail we parked our truck in a, in a, in a point and we walked for maybe an hour or two and so we got ready to come back to where my truck was parked. And this guy says, and I start going back the trail, which, which we came to the point from the truck from. And which it points went away from opposite direction. Sometimes in our life, when God calls us to do things, it looks like we're backing up. It looks like we're going in the wrong direction. But righteousness never takes you in the wrong direction. You know, don't ever trust your feelings when God's righteousness, mountain of righteousness is involved. Here's what this guy said that day. He said, well, Randy said, I have learned, he was a Georgia Tech graduate or something. He said that, he says, what I was taught was uh, the uh, shortest point, shortest distance, rather, between two points at a straight line. And he says, I don't think we need to be going back this way. This is the opposite. This is going to be the long one. So your truck is here, and he pointed. He said, we need to go straight to it. And I said, yes, but that, that is true. It's a, it's a straight line, it's short, but, but that's not always the best way. And so, but, you know, I could tell he was bent on doing that. And I didn't want to argue with him, and I kind of gave in, frankly, because I was hoping to get the guy's business done. I mean, that's how, that's how the flesh works. So we hit, we left that trail, and we get off that mountain. And we get down to those ravines, and we start crawling through mountain laurel and all kind of, st I don't even know, we, we couldn't hardly walk. And, and by about 30 minutes later, he said, you know what, said, let's try to get back on that trail. And uh, I felt so good, we got back on the trail. That, that's a lesson, see, there, there's no shortcut it's in righteousness. You know, the paths of righteousness, Jeremiah says, in Jeremiah 6, stand ye in your ways and ask, 
for the old paths and walk therein. You know what? That's the path of righteousness. You know, you know the cows in my pasture. One thing I've noticed about them, they don't, they'll they'll walk the same path. They'll walk a path, and, and we need to walk the path that God has given us to to to. And He has given us the path because He has made that path by the cross of Calvary. And, and so may the Lord bless us to to use and be blessed of Him there. Uh, may He may He be honored and glorified. May we always try to live for Him in a righteous way. You know, it's really the least we can do. It's, it's His righteousness, not ours. Uh, but let's don't waste it. Let's, and when that fire's burning in your heart and when you see things going on in this world that upset you, you know what's causing that? Your righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that lives in you. Let's have a prayer together. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day. We thank you for your righteousness. Lord, help us to live righteously for you. It'll be a great influence. We'll have more peace and joy. And Lord, if we can live that way, we'll die that way. And we thank you, Lord, that we can have that peace, that valley, the shadow of death, the presence of your spirit, the precepts of your word. And even though we struggle, we thank you, Lord, that the victory we have in Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.